We move on with the second session. We move into the world of uh, venture capital, film, money, business. And the second session is called Divided or Divorced? Why can't Europe's audiovisual content business raise venture capital? We have three uh, speakers, Ilan Girat, Marco Zuta, and Nitam Patak. And it will be moderated by Colin Brown. Stage is yours. Hi. Uh, yeah, this works. Works. Um, morning, everyone. And that was, uh, it's, that's a tough act to, to follow the, uh, the discussions this morning. Um, this is a panel about uh, uh, venture capital um, or risk capital. And, and I use that word because uh, you, you'll notice that's one of uh, Lord Putnam's uh, uh, comments. Those who, who listened into the, uh, the, the video at the, at the beginning talked about you know, can we create structures in which risk capital um, can, more risk capital can come into, into the film industry? And, uh, you know, there's venture capital is nothing if not risk, risk capital. So it's relevant there. Um, the provocative title of the panel is Why Can't the European Audiovisual uh, Content Industry Attract More uh, Venture Capital or Business Venture Capital? Um, the subtext, and another way to express it that sort of ties into the, um, the, 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 the territoriality debate uh, this morning, is we have a, a continent here that has enormous wealth of talent. It has wealth of technology, sometimes money, not always if you're making films, but it, money is there. So let's put it another way. Why are we not seeing a European version of Netflix being created? Why are there not more European media tech-related startups that could um, you know, bolster uh, the prospects of the, of the European film industry? And before I introduce my panel, I just want to give this some context, uh, at least the, the framework I'm coming from. Um, I, despite the accent, I, I live and work in, in New York. One of my uh, hats that I wear is working for a company called Slated. Now, Slated is a film financing platform online, but it's created by tech entrepreneurs. It's modeled after a website that raises money for startups called AngelList. Um, it's trying to raise money from tech startups to put it into film, uh, to, from tech, sorry, from tech angel investors and tech venture capital firms, uh, to, you know, um, and also the people who've made their money in tech who often want to put money into film. And just to make it more just interesting, we're trying to do, apply a venture capital model of financing to the film world. Um, so, you know, I come from this thinking, you know, why cannot more venture capital uh, go into the, into the film industry? Um, that all said, the VCs I talk to in America, you know, the very same, many of them do put money into film. I then say, well, what are the models you apply? How do you, how do you invest? Do you apply the same VC thinking that you do from your day life in, into, your, into your film life? And they say, turn back and say, oh, no, 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 no. I, we don't do that. When I invest in film, it's a hobby. My day job is to invest in venture capital companies that I've never seen, you know, very risky ventures, new ideas, groundbreaking ideas. And of course, I'm left thinking, well, why can't you apply that same thinking to, to film? Why is the film industry always considered this sort of, uh, you know, uh, n not a proper business, one that's, is need, that needs constant support, you know, in, here in Europe, for instance. Um, but in the, in the States, it's not treated as seriously as I think it, it should. Um, so with that, with that framer, um, I, let's uh, discuss, start the discussion. And what I'll do is I'll... Um, this is a fabulous panel of experts, by the way. I'll get everyone to introduce themselves um, in, as, in, as, in as snappy a form as possible. If you could just talk about what you do um, at your company, what the com what, or companies, or what the companies do, and, uh, and, and your, your basic philosophy on, on investment in, let's call it, the media and technology sector. So I'll start with you, Marcus. Yeah. Hi. I am Marcus Udam, 
And for the last seven years, I have worked with uh, Skype co-founders in Estonia. Behind Skype, there was one Swedish guy, one Danish guy, and four Estonians who basically created the technology uh, engineers. And, and when Skype was sold to eBay, these four Estonians kept their money in, in one pocket and, um, and started investing it um, across different asset classes, but also to venture capital, and mostly to venture capital. So, um, so far we have had 30 companies we have invested around the world, in US, uh, UK, France, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, China, Russia, Estonia, and so on, and mostly to technology-based um, startups. Um, we have also invested in, into the platforms that, that are related to um, semi-professional um, uh, video producers, particularly in the US. Uh, we have done a couple of games as well. And, and I think the first portfolio we have had, third investments we have had, has been very much also lessons learned. For example, we don't invest anymore in games. Um, part, partly also because actually the four Skype guys, when they started their career, they tried to do game <laughs> themselves as well. And, and they figured out it's just so tough that, that that's why we, we also don't, don't invest in games. Um, and, uh, and, and currently, currently um, me and my colleagues, we are setting up a new venture capital fund uh, for Baltics, Scandinavia, and the rest of Europe, uh, looking for new investments in, in everything online, digital startups, technology-based startups, particularly where the company has some IP uh, some technology differentiating uh, factor in it as well. Uh, Nita. Yeah. Yeah, good um, afternoon. My name is uh, Nitan Patak. Uh, I'm not a Bollywood actor, unfortunately, so no dancing today. Um, I'm actually, I have actually a boring job working for um, the European Investment Fund. Um, so the European Investment Fund is actually investing in financial intermediaries, um, financial intermediaries like uh, venture capital funds um, and also other financial intermediaries that are uh, providing guarantee schemes to uh, startups or, or small and medium enterprise. And uh, actually I'm here today in my capacity of uh, a business developer at the European Investment Fund to actually understand a little bit better the nature uh, of um, the creative industry uh, to be able to uh, develop new products that could actually address a little bit better this sector. Um, we actually do not understand the, the, the business model in detail of this sector and as an investor into financial intermediaries or into venture capital fund, we are looking at uh, um, at trying to put new player in place that could actually demonstrate us that we could have an impact on the society through uh, uh, these intermediaries and also make money. At the moment, the, the reputation that uh, the creative industry has uh, for us as a limited partner is none because we don't understand it very well. So I hope that today I can, through some example, explain that we are addressing the sector by actually investing through uh, venture capital firms into technology that are used in the creative industry um, and maybe you know one of the outcome will be that something you know is changing and that we can actually address it a bit better by having maybe venture capital firms that have uh, a thematic focus on the creative industry that we can support. Uh, just to wrap this around with some figures, can you give me an estimate of roughly how much the EIF uh, invests in Europe, you know, on an annual basis, um, and how much that leverages, I mean, how much in total is the venture capital yeah. market? Yeah, so actually um, what we do is uh, um, the, the, we roughly invest 1.9 billion into the venture capital and private equity space. Euros. Yes, euros. And uh, what we try to do is to not have more than 30% stake into each fund. So these um, 2 billion are actually leveraged into, uh, I would say, you know, three times to four times more money 
that is available uh, in the market for uh, final beneficiaries that we call uh, the small and medium enterprise, so the startups. So whether we spend, uh, roughly is 50-50, we are spending one billion into private equity and one billion into uh, venture capital. Um, the private equity business is addressing established and larger kind of companies, which I think maybe the creative industry is not really part of. But in venture capital, I think there's significant amount of money that um, uh, is there, you know, for um, entrepreneur innovation and, and startup. I'll, I'll come back to those things. And Ilan? Uh, my name is Ilan Girard. Uh, I am uh, first place a, a, a producer based in France and a finance consultant. Um, the reason I'm here is because uh, I've set up a, a website called uh, online film financing, uh, which is a database about uh, all, well, most of the uh, funding program, public funding programs around the world. We cover 700 different funding programs. And uh, a little bit about my background, um, I was trained as a lawyer and studied political sciences. I was very early uh, an advocate of uh, the EU and I was at the very early stage of the Erasmus program 30 years ago <laughs> as a student. Uh, and since I've been involved in different aspects of the, of the film economy, I was a sales executive, I was a business affair for a company called Pandora Cinema. Uh, and for the last uh, about yeah, 12, 15 years, I've, I've been on my own as a producer. I won the producer of March of the Penguin, Goodbye Bafana, Lebanon, several European films, uh, and as a finance consultant. And I, I really think that um, there's a new value chain being created and in our industry. And this is why I come up with this idea of putting up you know, a tool for producer. Uh, to enable producers to better work with each other so that there is more transparency in the transaction about what kind of public funding they can come up with. This is what we spoke, talk, uh, what we heard before in the previous panel about the importance of co-production in Europe to build a, a sustainable industry, but also um, to uh, come up with a, a way of helping the public funding to leverage private equity. And this is a kind of ultimate goal of my website. So maybe you can speak to that about uh, yeah. a bit later. I'll come, I'll come back to that. Um, Marcus, if I could re return to you. Um, I wanted to pick up on a conversation we had earlier um, because I think it's so relevant to the discussion we heard this morning. Tell us from a VC point of view, forget film, just from a sort of investment, you know, venture capital point of view, um, what your view is essentially of, of investing in territories as opposed to across Europe and, and you know, what the land, landscape is like and, and uh, what, what would make, how would y your chances of returning an investment improve, I think, you know, um, across Europe? Um, what would you like to be, see done? But, yeah. yeah. So um, putting Europe into perspective in, in venture capital, is actually kind of eye-opening uh, eye opening fact. I, I, I went through the US, Asia, and Europe, how much startups got venture funding in last, just last quarter in, in Q3. And um, the financing in US for all startups was at the level of 20 billion. So um, pretty good. In Asia, it was uh, 13 billion. And over the last couple of years, it has gone up from 7 to, to 13. So clearly, more investors are looking at Asia. Europe, uh, whole Europe, outside of European Union borders as well, 700 million people, more than twice than in the US, uh, got 3.5 billion. 3.5. 20 billion, 13 billion, 3.5. And then in Europe, it has been steady, almost steady. Okay, you might say, from three to three and a half, fluctuating around that. But it has been almost steady in Europe. Uh, even the population is, is, is twice as large as, as in US. And just to compare, New York only got two billion. Whole Europe is almost on the level of New York in venture, venture funding. And, uh, and how, 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 how did it come to this place? <laughs> I mean, how it happened? 
and uh, and and maybe it, it is it is definitely not the whole truth. You you never know uh, what is really behind it. But um, in Europe, we we have tried to develop the markets country by country, and some of the countries are really small ones, like Estonia, and and governments have uh, tried to do all the good and and to develop you know your local marketplace and your local country with your taxpayers money so um and then we have created in europe so many venture capital firms that can allow or that can invest in one country only and now if you create venture capital fund that can invest in estonia for only for example it can be successful but the probability is just low because the number of startups you can invest is smaller than you could, for example, invest across all over the US. So you have lower probability of making positive returns. And in some ways, it is true. Venture capital returns in Europe, in average, is, is zero. And the US at the same time is doing, in average, 10%. It is easy to say, don't invest in average, but uh, select the better ones. But, um, but the average is zero. And, and I think Baltic countries have been, been really revolutionary in, in these terms. Uh, with the help of European Investment Fund, we have created Baltic, Innova uh, Baltic Innovation Fund, which is collaboration of three countries. It's a great step forward, three countries acting together it is not our taxpayers' money goes to Estonia only. It is about sharing the, the kind of investments across countries uh, nearby. And, uh, and, and this actually allows us substantially to improve the probability that we make positive returns. Why it matters? It allows us to raise more venture capital funding for startups. I must say, I, I, have, raised, uh, I have been raising the venture capital fund now almost for three years. Maybe I'm really bad at doing it. <laughs> but most, uh, most first-time funds in our region um, actually spend so long time. And part of it is really educating pension funds, uh, family offices, so on, who have never invested in this asset class, simply because, in average, return is zero. And, uh, and very few, actually, who invest in venture capital say, I have portfolios of investing 70% to U.S., 30% to Europe. Uh, so preferring also U.S. Um, US um, opportunities. So um, I think the key lessons learned for me has definitely been that we can only get the returns right. We can only attract, let's say, big money to, to European scene if Europe acts as one, not as country by country. It is, it is boring, probably, to listen, but unfortunately, profits matter to these pension funds, to fund managers, to family offices, and this criteria. And, and to repeat the question I asked you earlier, I thought, um, it, someone hearing that from the outside would say, well, yes, if you just think of it as a European thing, that all the money would just go to Berlin and London and Paris, um, but that wouldn't necessarily play out that way. Is that correct? Definitely, that is right now way more money available in UK and Germany. And if, if we raise, like, fund, let's say, 50 million euros, 100 million euros, and all of us would go to London, we, we understand the competition is too hard. There is so much discussion about, you know, is this startup Estonian or Latvian or German or Finnish? Um, how you classify startups where one founder is Estonian, the other one is Japanese, and it's established in, in Germany? Or two guys from Guatemala, all product development and co-founder in Estonia as well, and it's established in New York. It really doesn't matter. The question is where you have early access to deals. And, and we are setting up the fund um, here in Tallinn. We plan to stay in Tallinn. And we plan to review all the opportunities around us. Uh, and, and even, you know, you might know a company called TransferWise, which has been headquartered from day one in London. But the early access opportunity to invest into it was in Estonia. Because the founders are Estonians, they know, you know, we know all each other and so on. 
So I, I don't believe really that if you allow fund managers to invest all across Europe, they immediately or kind of flock to Germany or, or to UK. Because early access to deals, the kind of talent is distributed equally everywhere. But so far, the talent has been forced to move to Berlin or UK or US immediately because just the funding is not available in this area. Natana, if, if you could pick up on that, um, that thought. And also, I mean, before the EIF, I was reading your bio, before EIF, you, you, were in the, you worked in the TMT sector, so you had the expertise. What is your perception of the creative industries as an investment opportunity? I mean, good and bad. I mean, so, uh, you know, what is, what, is, what is the perception that VCs are going to have to fight against if they're ever going to get into, seriously into, into the European creative industry? Well, um, <clears throat> um, I think in my, in my, um, in my uh, experience as a banker, I didn't, uh, I didn't do many media-related deals, so I'm not be able to comment on that. I'd like to, um, to, to follow on, on uh, what Marcus has said. Um, I think um, the, 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 one of the things that he said, which is right, is investments are local. So people tend to invest locally uh, because it's easier when you're a startup or when you are uh, like uh, an engineer with a great idea to go and see uh, people who are around you and uh, they trust you. And even if you're an investor, you rather invest in something that you can see and touch than something that is maybe uh, sitting 2,000 kilometers away. So I think uh, uh, there is a need to uh, make more financing available in local markets. So this is one of the, 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 the response from the EIF, is to create uh, local teams and also to bundle them through a regional uh, initiative like the Baltic Innovation Fund. So this is one point. The second point that I would like to make is it res with respect to performance. Yes, venture capital is not performing very well in Europe, but it all depends on when you start looking at the performance. So if you start looking at the performance from the 1990s years, you know, there's been several kind of cycles. And yes, you know, we have a, a bit of a difficult time to compete against the US market with their performance. However, if you look, you know, from 2008 onwards, you know, uh, we see some very good team performing very well. And the venture capital in Europe is becoming an asset class that is becoming more and more attractive to investors that are local, Europe, but also um, you know, Asian and US investors taking more and more uh, stake into European venture capital teams. Uh, third point I want to make is we see more and more cross-border deals uh, where uh, venture capital teams are investing outside their home turf into um, established companies. So this is exactly the problem we have. The company has to be a bit established for a UK or a German uh, investor to invest into a startup based in Estonia. So how do we address like the early phase or the seed phase of, uh, of a company? I think that uh, we are trying to address these companies by empowering new uh, type of investors. And uh, if I may, maybe think loud, uh, for the creative uh, and media industry, I think business angels have to maybe uh, play a more active role. Business angels are local and uh, they know uh, the people and the, sometimes the business they invest in. And what we have done uh, at the European Investment Fund is we have created a co-investment scheme where we select business angel as we would select venture capital firms. So we select individuals and we commit to co-invest with them into projects. So of course, uh, when you do the selection of such a business angel, you look at his track record. So you need to have business angels that are successful in investing in a given focus or in a given area, which sometimes is difficult to find. Now, I have to be honest, we have not yet encountered a business angel that has successfully invested in the creative media industry. And if there are some, 
they should actually come and see us because we like to include them in the program. So um, I think what we have been trying to do with the European Commission as well is to address this uh, sector by building capacity. We call it capacity building, which is actually um, a kind of uh, increasing the knowledge and the understanding of this sector. We are trying to put in place a guarantee scheme to guarantee financial in intermediaries, uh, to give them some security so that they can invest into um, uh, startups and companies in this field. I think this is phase one. Phase two will follow with equity investments. And for these equity investments, we need to have more VC firms, you know, with a track record uh, into this industry sector, more business angels, you know, who can show us that this um, sector is a profitable one and has an impact on the society. Um, the last point uh, that I would like to, to make on, on that is, um, is actually um, we are indirectly addressing this sector by investing in technologies that are used in the creative uh, and uh, media industry. For example, we invest in semiconductor development um, through a fund in Belgium. These kind of semiconductor chips are used into iPhone that have a higher, increasing the processing power to allow them to see videos and uh, which results in people being able to watch films in their iPad on their iPhone. Um, we have invested in Spotify, which is a, a content provider. Uh, we could imagine an equivalent, you know, for, for the movie industry. Um, so there's a lot of kind of concrete technology examples that are addressing the creative and media industry, but we don't have like one player who would have like a, a theme uh, with respect to his investment program addressing this uh, particular uh, sector, which I would be very keen to see in Europe. Uh, has anyone ever come to you? Um, I mean, you're investing in one remove, I think, so from, but, but what happens if a, a film fund came to you, a private one, for Europe? I mean, what would they have to do to, I mean, and you could, could you treat that as venture capital that you would then co-invest? Yes, I think we have a very, um, uh, I would say, uh, uh, detailed uh, due diligence um, uh, process that uh, uh, he went through <laughs> and he survived uh, because we are gladly investing and supporting uh, uh, the fund. Um, what, what we try to do is, um, and I will be very uh, kind of brief on our um, process, but it's important for people to understand what we are looking at, you know, when we assess the viability of a fund proposal. And we look at three things. Uh, first, it's the team. So how, is these, how are these people, how did they come together? Did they work together? Do they have an experience in the field? So this can be life science, clean tech, uh, ICT, or media or creative media. So we look at the team. Uh, are they going to stick together for the, for the life of the fund? Because usually it's a long time. It's like five years for investment and another five years to exit these investments. So it's a 10 years kind of marriage, you know, uh, between uh, individuals that, um, that are very competent, sometimes have ego issues, sometimes are very passionate about what they do. So we look at the team. The second thing that we look is the market opportunity. Is there a market opportunity with respect to the investment focus of the fund? Uh, so uh, if, for example, we have, unfortunately, a fund looking at the semiconductor industry in Europe, unfortunately, this industry sector has lost a little bit of, um, of uh, momentum. So maybe, you know, it would be difficult for them to invest 100, 200 million in only semiconductor related technology companies. So we look at whether the market opportunity is sound, which in my opinion at the creative industry, it is. And then we look at the fund parameters. So this is more like the technicality of the fund. So how many portfolio companies the fund gonna have? How much money are they gonna invest into each of these companies? How, how long does it take for these companies to become viable and to be able to be exited so that the investor of the fund and the fund is seeing some money coming back. So I call that the magic triangle, you know, so this defines a little bit the investment strategy of the fund. 
and if all has to gl be glued a bit together. And I think, to conclude this, I think that what I see in the, uh, in the film industry, on the production or creative kind of industry, I think that we can find those people, the market opportunity and the parameter to have successful funds. We just need people to educate the investor community to feel more reassured that this is an asset class, or this is a sector focus that um, would uh, be um, good for investor to, to look at. Okay. So, Elana, you could pick up on that. I mean, on the face of it, um, here's, here's, an, here's a business sector, the audiovisual one, that that's, receives a lot of soft money in Europe. Uh, so, right there, some of the risk is, is removed from the investment. So why isn't there more private money in Europe, venture capital type money, sitting alongside that? You know, why, why is there not enough, you know, it's, it's still, you know, still a sort of patchwork of, of, of pre-sales and, 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 if you're lucky, TV sales and so on. But the private equity model or the, the, and, and venture in its broadest term doesn't really sit alongside. And yet, you know, the, 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 this could be a great public-private partnership, I think. I mean... What, what, as a producer as well as you know, at Alfie, I wonder what, what your thoughts were on that. Okay, so as a producer, uh, yes, this is, it's, it's, this is true. It's very difficult to attract uh, private equity uh, to a uh, European film project. Uh, and uh, there's, I think, different set of reasons for that. Um, uh, number one, uh, private equity is quite expensive. <laughs> So I would say that uh, the, 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 the projects which are likely to get uh, funded through a mix of public funding and market money, uh, being the distributors, uh, MGs, uh, and sometimes a bit of gap, uh, those projects uh, don't go to the private equity. Um, the bank will take the risk uh, and it stay within the family. Uh, then there is another reason, um, which is that uh, there is not that many incentive locally for private investor to come on board. Uh, I am at the moment um, developing a project, um, a film about Merce Cunningham, the American choreographer. It's a 3D film with a team with a team that Wim Wenders used for Pina. What is really interesting in this project is that uh, my um, uh, my objective is to raise. Uh, a third of the budget from the US, from private equity, and two thirds from Europe, uh, from a mix of um, public funding and uh, market money. Uh, in the US, we already raised half of the money. Why is that? Because we have actually a lot of donation, so whether this is equity or not, but there's a very strong incentive to make donation in the US. Uh, and, um, and if you create the, the right uh, you know, environment, um, this money will come on board. And then, yes, we, we're going to um, uh, match those donations with private equity. So I, I find out, I mean, I'm one of the few producers in Europe that is, uh, has been able to put together <laughs> private equity or private investors uh, in the loop uh, because uh, very often my, my film have, have, are a very strong brand the film I did about uh, Nelson Mandela, I, I brought in, you know, private equity from, actually there was a Russian company on board. Um, so there is there's different configuration, but I feel that we don't have this culture of private equity. And if we could have a structure where uh, the public money is, incentivi is incentivizing private equity to come on board, that will make a huge difference. Just a, another brief example. I'm now working on a on a film project, very prestigious director and 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 and, and team. Um, we found someone in the UK saying, "I do the old thing. I don't need a bank. I I will I will fully finance." And actually, this is coming to be the Netflix approach too. Uh, why don't you bother doing you know all those kind of deals? We'll take we'll take over. When they take over, there's nothing left. So there's just building a library. And I have to say that I was at the AFM this year, and it was a big change because everybody's looking at China because there's a lot of money in China. The Chinese money is for Chinese film. This has to be said. Um, but, uh, and then there is this kind of um, 
the Netflix, Google, Amazon thing going on, where they, they, just, they just take everything. Uh, and what is left of the independent business, even the studio business, is somehow at risk. What is left of the independent business is that uh, we are struggling to get our film released with all the challenges of, uh, of you know, the, the, the division of the European market, everybody in his own territory, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think we need, you know, your kind of initiative to help, um, to help, you know, private firms to step to come on board and help, you know, independent producer to put together their film. And I think development money is key in that, in that, uh, in that uh, territory. Marcus, you want to add something? So I think it, it's actually always good to, to understand the kind of venture funds, private equity funds mindset as well. And, and maybe it's a bit, um, I, I'll make it a bit extreme as an example, but um, so let's assume you, you set up a startup you found it, and, uh, and, 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 and you take some venture capital money as well. And you have opportunity to sell it for 100 million euros. Would you be happy? 100 million euros. Would it be okay? Sounds good. Let's assume venture capital has 25% of your company, and, uh, and, and you have 75, you have 75 million euros out of that exit. Sounds good. Okay. Now, let's assume that this venture capital fund is, has 500 million euros under management. So it means that this fund needs to return to their investors 1 billion 500 million. So three times money back, right? And uh, I'm sorry about numbers, but, but keep. <laughs> so, so. Um, and, and now, assuming we have this great 100 million euro exit, the fund will get back 25 million. The fund manager needs to find 1 billion 475 million more out of from other investments. And it's pointing that, that for example, in our fund, we, we are looking to raise 50 million euro fund and return, you know, minimum 150 million. But Looking at the statistics, we cannot look opportunities that have less potential than like 300, 500 million euros as exit. So this is a kind of ambition that needs to be in the mind. And again, looking at statistics, looking at probabilities and so on, 100 million exit might look great, but depending on the fund manager, it might be really trouble. It is, it is kind of lost bullet in the game. On that basis, is any of the creative industry at all of a, you know, you've, you, gaming, which is by all accounts a successful, you know, industry that, you know, the film industry and, and TV industry looks emulously on, I think, at some point. You, you've, you, you have no interest in that anymore. What, I mean, actually, what would tempt you it, back it, in? It, it really assumes, we have done a couple of games. One, one is doing actually very well in the US. Um, but what we have learned really, you need to build a portfolio on only games. You, you cannot do like one game or two games or three games because no one is, is exceptionally good picker and then picking only winners. And, and also for business angels actually, the statistics of making positive returns starts to work from third investments and onward. So if I, if I do like five investments, I think you, you might be lucky. And, but statistics actually doesn't prove that you make constantly positive returns doing one to three investments. And, and that's why we see more and more game dedicated funds that invest only in one game, uh, sorry, in, in 30 games and, and games only. And they have one supercell, one Angry Birds coming out of it, and that's it. Mm -hmm. You can return the money. I'm going to open it up to, to, to the floor, to the questions. Um, the light is shining on me, but. Um, I, yeah, somebody over here. If you were to make a database of private equity or film financiers in Europe, would it be 70? Would it be 700? 
How many actual film financiers are there that are not institutional in your estimate and from your experience? That's, that's a very good question, actually. I'm working on this. <laughs> uh, I think the idea is that we could match, you know, those private investors' equity with the public funding, as long as they understand where the public funding is. Um, I think that there is more and more uh, private initiative to invest in films. Uh, I think there's one of the reasons that maybe why I go a little bit against your statistic, okay, uh, is that uh, film assets are very sexy assets. They can bring investors to invest in a portfolio of other activities. So this is a huge plus for industry. And this is how the industry has survived, I have to say. If you go to LA, you, you find out that every five years there is, a new, um, there is a new group of people investing in LA you know, for just you know, the glory of being in the film business. So this is a very big asset. Uh, number two, I think that today, if you consider the, the way the value chain is going to change, there's huge opportunities. Uh, over the 10 years I, I've been on my own, 12 years I've been on my own, I've generated half a billion US dollar in uh, box office revenues on my films, okay? Of course, one of those films is March of the Penguin. The big problem, okay, is that very little of that money goes back to the producer and the right holders. It's kind of uh, disseminated, you know, over many intermediaries. And where we're going now is that there will be less intermediaries uh, and, you know, a different way of, of, of accounting, you know, the revenues of the film. So I think we should encourage, you know, those uh, private investors to come on board. And I'm still working on today on, you know, making the matrix for a fund which will be for small films, not the very big one, up to 10 million. The big one uh, are not that profitable. This is the truth about the film business. They are volume. And a lot of, of big players live on volumes. The profits, they come from the very small film. And personally, with my track, uh, my track record has been with very tiny film being extremely profitable. So it's also a way of picking them, I think, you know, to fill the marketplace, to fill where the audience goes. The audience is aging, for example. So art house, art house film have a future. Uh, so there's different way of marketing it. And I think that it comes really from the very start of, uh, you know, uh, the development of a project. And there's one big player, you know, which, is, which has been all the time you know, taking the hits, it's the producer, and I think producer should be, should be put back in the loop, not taking the first risk, you know, it's producers first in, last out. I think we should have a better position in the value chain. So this is what one website is about. Or, uh, or, or do we, I mean, one, one of the things I hear back from tech investors looking at film deals on paper is that, the structure, the way we structured, which we've inherited from an old legacy, I think, of film when, the, when there was a lot of money around, it, it's really hard to get your head around because the, the money, the, the people who take the most risk in film mm -hmm. are the ones who are last in line to, to, to get rewarded. I mean, it's, it's almost back to front. And, and you talk to tech people and say, well, look, if I'm on the hook for this up front and I, I deserve to get, I'm first in line to get paid and I, my, my risk should be rewarded. I'm wondering whether the structure of film deals has to be, you know, you know, re rethought. I think it has to be changed completely. Uh, and I think this is why it's a very exciting time for everyone. Uh, and especially in Europe, we have this great opportunity of having, you know, uh, public funds that can, you know, leverage uh, the market value of films. But uh, there is a structure, you know, the fee structure, you know, all these kind of... Uh, you know what? You know the the, the, the water flow. You know of um, of what do you call it? The waterfall. The waterfall. The waterfall. I, I, the waterfall the, the of the revenues. It's crazy. And now with uh, VOD, it's it's even getting worse. So um, so this is this is where the big problem is, I think. And for the investors, if you tell an investor, and why I'm working on it, why don't you just take that that bit of the value chain, take a risk on this, then you can do something. And, and if, if you look at the kind of tech investments or, you know, software or whatever, uh, quite often uh, founders actually might have majority or 50%, some cases a bit less, but then the value might be very high. And, and actually, in, in start cases, founders might be in a position where they get most of some money or enough 
that they can actually create new venture funds, become investors, and, and start investing back to the ecosystem. So that, that's a very valid point, how the actually success cases are, how is the waterfall, who gets and how much is, is really critical. That's a very good point. There was a question behind, yeah. Hi, Hi. That's it. Yep. I'm uh, Eric. Uh, I'm organizing uh, a program uh, under Estonian Film Institute uh, where we're trying to tackle this, this pro problem or this huge gap between the investors and the producers. So we're go aiming to bring together the producers and investors to actually start to understand each other and start to uh, like know, get more information about each other's areas because we've seen from the investor's side that they have no idea. They have, they have no idea what this whole thing is about. How, how could I invest or how could it be profitable? And also from the producer side, I think there's a huge problem, like kind of a problem that you didn't much like talk about, but the fact that uh, the public funding is also about the mindset. Because the producers always in our region have this mindset that, that I'll get money from the, from the public sector, so pitching to them, uh, telling your idea, and all this, all this environment is, is very different uh, from us doing it to private investors. But I think there's a lot of uh, cooperation to be done because the public money is not going anywhere uh, in, in our region. So from an investor side, you can, you can imagine this as a startup uh, investment round where you have 80% already covered by the, by the public monies, but then you have 10 to, uh, 5 to 20% that you only have to cover from the uh, private sector, and you will get the whole revenue, you together with the producer, because the government like, doesn't need to get the money back. So there's, there's a, I think the, I've been in the game industry myself as well. I think the biggest difference be, between the game industry is that in games, like, there's no public money, there's no government money. And because of that, there are still a lot of enthusiasts who like to do games. So they are also very active and very energetic to sell their ideas to investors. And, and they, just, they are in the need of getting the money from the private sector. That's not the case with the film, film sector. So I think there's a huge gap that we could uh, also... Um, help and just like bringing together and also like work, work a lot about the knowledge of, of this area. Any comments on that? Or, yeah. I mean, just to go back, I mean, what do you, as you're trying to harmonize those two worlds, what, what's working for you? Are you, uh, are you, what's, are you successfully convincing the, the people that... Uh, this, uh, this is a very new initiative. Uh, we're curr currently getting the people together. Uh, the program itself starts from next year. So, but uh, currently we have uh, brought in some experts uh, from around the world who have been uh, actively uh, focused on the media and film industry, VCs, VC companies in this area from UK, uh, US, even one uh, is just like started this year in Finland with a 13 million capital already, only focused on media, it's a VPR. Uh, so, our goal is to bring, bring the people together, also really like start to talk about it, uh, share the shared experience, experience, share the knowledge, and uh, that's, that's it about basically. Any other questions? Oh, just over here, and then, yeah. I just want to add that, I just want to add, I'm coming from Luxembourg, where we have a lot of funds uh, for, for Swiss chocolate and for, for um, Italian cars and there is even one or two funds for French-speaking films. I know Ilan uh, knows it. And, and the Luxembourgish Producers Association is trying now to set up... I mean, we have also public funding. We are quite happy with that. We can invest more or less 30% in, 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 a, in a minoritarian co-production. We can be co-producers. Uh, and, and, and now we are trying to find other ways. And, of course, we're doing the same like you. We're trying to, to see why... Is it not working that there are so many investment funds uh, parked in Luxembourg and so, money, so much money available? And, and the, the reason is always the same. As you just said it, we don't know what this business is about. That's what the bankers say. That's what the investors say. They all, they all learn about everything. But our, I think it's because our business, uh, there, there are no rules. There are no, uh, there are no, no fantastic... Uh, um, uh, formulas that you can uh, attach to it, but there are ways of of trying to minimize the risk to fail to failure, and yet you will you will fail. So what we are trying to do is more or less saying that we want to bring together key players of all Europe. We don't even want to invest in Luxembourgish films. We want to invest in European films. We want to get the thing started. We have. Uh, 
we have put up, uh, we have talked to our local authorities. Um, just, just to tell you this, uh, Luxembourg is known as a banking place. We never get our finances, our pre-financing, our, our loans from Luxembourgish banks. We go to Paris, we go to uh, Coffee Ciné, Coffee Loisir, and the, these kind of, let's say, specialized banks that, that give us, that, that pre-finance our, our things. So what, so what I'm going to say is that we have to stick together, we have to change the thinking of investment capital in film business must be different than uh, than investing in chocolate or or in uh, in, in in cars or something else or uh, gold uh, or whatever. But but trying to find a way of working together and just putting um, uh, not asking um, not asking the the world, but asking maybe 20 percent of what is missing, and also give them uh, a recoupment uh, line of uh, a priority. How do you say? Uh, um, what is the what, what is the, the name Ilan? If you have a, a first recoupment, that you are the first in the first guy who gets in the money, the investors are, are the first, the premier, uh, first position. Sorry, I was looking for the terms. And and at the end of the uh, at the end of the the day, it's interesting maybe that all these initiatives we are trying to start this uh, investment uh, thing by just getting from our Luxembourg estate. Uh, the promise that for the beginning we can give our investors a uh, return of 30% like a tax shelter and then the risk, uh, just minimizing the risk. Well, well, if I could, uh, just an observation here because um, I, I, um, there, there are very, f I mean the, part of the problem is there are very few statistics unlike the tech sector where everything is so data driven, I know exactly, you know, to the nth degree, you know, and I know who's put money, how much in everything, and what the returns are, and everything it just exists in film. But um, as an exercise, we, we looked at, uh, stated at, at sort of uh, risk profiles of, of, a, of an, an American independent film um, uh, versus uh, an American tech startup, you know, and, and you know, it wasn't great. There, it was, you know, the, the chances of that thing doing really, really well was about 3%. You could argue that figure. But here's the thing, this is why I'm making that point. What I realize is that the film industry, the, the tech industry looks at that and is focused on that 3% and how are they gonna, hit that 3% gonna generate, how much money is it gonna generate and how much of it's gonna come back to them. So it's focused on the winners, the 3%. The film industry, and you mentioned that word minimize risk, its entire focus is on how do you hedge against the 97% chance of losing. So the entire strategy is about getting the money out first, you know, and, and, and protecting yourself. Whereas in the tech industry, it's, well, I'm going to play this to make sure that when, when these things hit, the money comes back to me. And I think there's a mindset issue there, which, um, is, you know, it, which is hard to grapple. And I think the, the you know, pessimism, optimism thing here comes at play. So that's just an observation. But maybe commenting the question earlier as well and, and attracting investors uh, to look at opportunities and so on. I, I think allowed here, but, but I think maybe the crowdfunding type or absolutely always syndicating type of initiatives might be almost the only way. Because even in the startup scene, technology scene, you see that, you know, for example, in Estonia, when there is a seed investment of 100,000 euros, there are usually five or six investors behind it. And, and why is it so? If, if one investor would like to become angel investor, professionally, so making money out of it as well, and managing his or her assets professionally, then angel investor needs to put together at least, again, statistically 25, 30 investments. Uh, without syndication, one seat ticket is usually 100, 200,000 euros, so that startup can start doing something meaningful, which means that in minimum, the initial investments to 30 companies is something like 3 million euros. Now, at least in, in, in startup scene, you need to reserve quite a lot of money for follow-ons to invest later on in the same company. And, and in angel phase, it could be 70%. So one person should reserve at least 10 million euros professionally to venture capital if he or she wants to invest in the asset class alone. And then, you know, from all your assets, you shouldn't put maybe more than 10% to venture capital which means that the person must have 
100 million euro net assets. And, and, and we have very few of these type of people, really. That's why the kind of syndications and crowdfunding is, is, is probably the only way how you, how you could start thinking about it. We have five minutes, so maybe time for a couple. Well, Did you want to add to that? No? I can, Sorry. if I can go. Or, well, uh, I just want to actually, something you mentioned previously um, uh, about the idea that venture capital isn't particularly interested in film as an asset uh, because of the returns that it expects and also the, the sort of uh, volume of returns that it expects. I'm wondering if the discussion should shift a bit from production uh, which is not that uh, profitable or volume intensive in Europe, um, to more structural. Um, we haven't talked, for example, about the idea of a uh, pan-European P&A fund, partly backed by venture capital, maybe as a public-private partnership, or distribution structures, which I know there's a great interest on the political side to have that as a counter to the Netflix and Amazons of the world. Is there a room or interest on the venture capital side to get involved in something like that? Yeah, well, um, I think, you know, the, the recurrent kind of um, theme that is coming um, in all these questions is, uh, I think, uh, the fact that the investor community is not as educated as it should be to, uh, to address the need of this asset class. So I think uh, we are nothing than creative uh, in our industry. So uh, we are uncreative people. Uh, that are investing um, the same way for, for decades. So I think this is now a call uh, to uh, the, the sector to educate us and to uh, explain and uh, shift maybe the, 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 uh, there's a shift in minds uh, to, um, to address new type of business models. And um, I, I, I concur with you with respect to we cannot change everything, so we still have to build portfolios you know, of projects so uh, above 13 projects in a portfolio because uh, that, uh, that uh, from a risk uh, perspective, you know, we, uh, we feel more at ease. We need to learn from the successes of other uh, similar industry sector. I think gaming, um, we are seeing more uh, gaming funds coming to us uh, who have invested in the, in, uh, in the clash of clans or, or, or other kind of angry bird type of... Uh, um, games that have been successful and that went from a gaming to a production to entertainment. So uh, Angry Bird is now not only a game, but it's becoming a movie, it's becoming a, um, an entertainment park. And we are supporting um, uh, in, with different kind of instruments. For example, this um, uh, firm through uh, Atomico um, that we are very uh, uh, happy uh, to work with. So I think you know, it's a, it's a really a problem of uh, education and knowledge. Uh, and this is what we are trying to work with the European Commission in the frame of this guarantee scheme, so which is less scary for us. So we guarantee a financial intermediaries that will take the risk. Uh, but I think uh, we need to participate in all these forums, you know, to be able to uh, express our fears and, uh, uh, and that you can reassure us in terms of uh, talking about the risk profile of the investment in particular. Yeah, I mean, just just as, just to follow up, I am aware of a, a European P&A fund that was that was trying to raise money. It's been difficult because it's really difficult to explain what a P&A fund is to an investor. I mean, they they hard enough getting their head around the things, the other things, and then this P&A thing. What, what, what is that? Who get? You know, I don't understand that. So it, there. The education is, is absolutely critical, I agree. But, yeah. In that sense, I, I fully support your point. Actually, we, we learn ourselves through our investments as well. One company we invested in that actually didn't work out so well, but, uh, but it was a platform for semi-professional uh, video content. And, and through that investment, actually, we learned a lot about the industry. And, and maybe the only mistake, actually, the company did, they took just too much venture funding from the US. And you might say, looking back, Maybe too much money actually kills them. Not about the product, not about the content, whatsoever. So, but actually, through the investments, we are we are learning uh, more and more. So, on a bit positive note, I'm going to. Uh, we have to finish it here. But um, if I understood correctly, you both inviting people to pitch you. Is that was that correct? You <laughs> afterwards. So, uh, 
You know where to find everyone. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the, the panelists and, and for listening in, and uh, we'll look forward to the rest of the day. Thank you.